I don't know if I could separate myself from the martial arts. People say all the time that, you know, martial arts is part of my life. And I think my life is just part of martial arts. What's happening, everybody? And welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 630, with my guest today, Kyoshi Dave Ahrens. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, passionate traditional martial artist. And that's why we do all the things that we do here at Whistlekick. It's in support of you, the traditional martial artist. If you want to see what that means, go check out all the stuff we've got going on at whistlekick.com. It's our digital hub, if you will. And one of the things over there is our store. And yeah, it's one of the ways that we cover the expenses for this show and all the other wonderful content that we try to bring you multiple times each and every week. And if you use the code podcast 15, you save 15% lets us know that our efforts here with the show lead to some sales and it all hopefully connects dots and makes accounting people happy. If you want to go deeper on this or any other episode of the show, you're going to want a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week, and the entire purpose behind this show, well, it's to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists the world over. If you want to help guarantee future episodes of the show, there are lots of ways you can do that. You could make a purchase. Like I said, you could share an episode, follow us on social media. We're at at Whistlekick everywhere you could think of. You could tell a friend about us. Maybe pick up a book on Amazon, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Facebook or Google or anywhere else you could think of, or you could support our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick. Patreon is a place where we post exclusive content, and if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you get access to some of it. The more you contribute, the more we give you access to. I just wrote a huge update yesterday, gave Patreon insiders a behind-the-scenes look on a bunch of things going on at Whistlekick, including future episodes. Some that we've recorded, some that we haven't recorded yet. We've got some big names coming. And if you want to be the first to know what's coming for this show and the other things that we do, well, Patreon's a great place to go. And on top of that, those people get free merch. You sign up, we send you a bunch of stuff. So go check it out, patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Let's talk about today's guest. Longtime listeners know that we break a lot of stuff out from the episodes as quotes. Sometimes we use them in social media. We put one at the front of episodes. We choose one and we include it in the description for the podcast episode. Well, this was one of the most quotable episodes we've had in a long time, maybe ever. And really at the heart of it, it's a story about martial arts, but it's about belonging. And it was one that I really enjoyed. And I hope that you do as well. So here we go. Hey, Dave, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited to be here and I look forward to uh, to having a chat with you. Cool. Yeah. I, you know, one of the best honors that we ever get is when someone's come on the show and they say, you should go talk to this person. And not only do they just say, here's a name, go go talk to them, but they actually involve themselves in the process they they kind of serve it up for us you know let us know let let the the other guests know hey i had a good experience on this and that's kind of how you came to us isn't it yeah absolutely i um a, a good friend of mine sensei eric johnstone uh told me about it and said that you guys are doing really good work here and so that's what turned me on to it and became uh, an avid listener myself oh well cool yeah Th- there's there's nothing better to me than to hang out with martial artists, talk about martial arts, and then know that other martial artists are going to enjoy listening to our martial arts conversation. I mean, what is, what is better than that? Not much, especially <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, especially when you have somebody that, you know, you're chatting with somebody that, you know, loves it and is into it to, yeah. the, to the degree that you are. Um, I do love it. You know, I, I, I laugh all the time. And because I always say that there's there's two kinds of people that you have martial arts conversations with. Uh, one of them is kind of, you know, the, you know, hey, I heard you do karate. And <laughs> it turns into kind of a really odd conversation. You know, and then there's the people that, you know, see it from a similar perspective as you, uh, as something they, they do as part of their life. And uh, it really is. It's one of the best things. Yeah. 
And I think that that's something that almost everyone who's been on the show has in common, that it is part of their lifeblood. It is an aspect of who they are that becomes really hard to separate. You know, you can, you can take the training away from the person, but you know, they, they don't stop being a martial artist. Yeah. And I think a lot of us experienced that over the last 18 months or so, you know, what does, what does my relationship to martial arts look like when things are thrown for a loop? Yeah. I, um, I don't know if I could separate myself from the martial arts. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you, people say all the time that, you know, martial arts is part of my life. And I think my life is just part of martial arts. It's mm. just something that, you know, I'm, I'm just another cog in the wheel along the way, but there, there is no, def, no, there's no me without my karate. Mm. How long have you felt that way? Uh, do, you, do you remember a point where, where you had that realization? I, I would, cause the, the, the feeling has to come before the realization, right? I, I, really. I would, I would agree with you that the feeling has definitely has to come first. And I'm not sure if I really at the time, you know, quantified that as, you know, that kind of a feeling, it's probably been honed over the years mm. to, to, you know, really understand that. But I, I think, I think it came to a point when I felt like I had, I don't know if this is the right word, but a mission. I, I felt like there was a direction that I needed to go. It was kind of beyond, you know, me just wanting to go to the dojo and train in martial arts. Um, I felt like there was, there was some place I had to go, um, something driving me. And I don't even know to this day if I know what that thing is, because uh, it still drives me every day. Um, but sounds like some people might use the word calling. Yeah, I mean that's. I guess you could use that word. That that would be an apt description for, for it. Um, you know, I, I I don't know if it's been my calling my whole life, or is it? it, it that's something that I think we'll never find out. Is if you know, was I supposed to be here? Um, you know, but I, I definitely feel like this is, a, I'm exactly where I need to be. Mm. Um, That's a comfortable feeling. One that a lot of people don't experience. Agreed. Agreed. Um, yeah. So calling mission, you know, it definitely, definitely has had a huge impact on my life. And um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do martial arts until the day I die. And it's, it, you're right. There, there really is no separating, you know, the, the martial arts out of the martial artist, especially once they, once they've had that connection with it and, you know, it's gone beyond just a, just a hobby. Hmm. Now you're an instructor and I would imagine that you've had maybe not the same conversation, but similar conversations with students over the years. They've asked you about your relationship to training or, or when you got started, things, things like that. Questions that we generally ask on this show. But when you, when you have that conversation with your students about the, the blurriness between who you are as a person and who you are as a martial artist, or, or to say it another way, what you might look like at this time if martial arts was to somehow be extracted from you, you know, some alien space technology just sucks that knowledge out of you. When you have that conversation, I'm assuming you, you do, how does that go? How do you explain that to them? It's a really good question. And I'm glad that technology doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, I, I don't know if there's a picture in my head yet of myself without what martial arts has given me. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I, it would, it would have to bring me back. We would have to go back in time and, and look at, you know, who I was as a teenager when I started and, you know, what paths I was on and where I, where I believe now that I thought I was heading. Um, but I would, I would think it would be easy 
easy to say that if that technology did exist and that was taken out of me, I would probably be lost. Um, I don't know if I would know myself. Um, and, you know, when I have conversations with my students about, you know, the connection to who I am, I think they understand it, they see it, because, you know, again, whether I'm in a gi or not, you know, I'm always, I'm always me. And that has martial arts, you know, woven throughout it. But, you know, I think when, when talking to students, it usually ends up being in those those times where where they may be lost and they're trying to, you know, find their way to, you know, do I want to continue to do this? And, you know, do I want to make this a lifelong venture? And because, you know, once they've gotten to that point, then and the, the the conversation, you know, changes because they're they've already, you know, what we tend to term as lifers in this. Mm. But um, you know, to to a student that is trying to figure out if they want, if they want, you know, do they really want karate martial arts in their life, you know, in, in the, the current state, you know, so for instance, you know, are they coming to the dojo? Are they training? Um, you know, cause we all know that, you know, once you do martial arts, even if it's for a little while, everything that you learn is going to be with you forever. It may not be in the forefront of your, of your consciousness, um, but it, but it's in there, but, you know, for, for trying to separate the karate out, you know, in that way. And I think, again, for me, I don't know if, again, I don't know if I have a, a, a vision of that. I don't know if I want to. Mm. <laughs> so let's take that knowledge about you and let's, you know, roll back the tape of your life. You said you started as a teenager. Did yeah. you feel lost as a teenager when you started training? So. So I think if we go back that far, um, you know, I was a, 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 a child of a, of a split family. My parents divorced, you know, when I was preteen, um, separated between two different states. And so I think there's some natural confusion and anger and that kind of stuff. And I definitely felt like I was a, um, an angry young man when I was, when I was that age. I didn't know what I was looking for. Didn't know, didn't even know that I needed anything at that age. You know, just trying to deal with the stresses of life and things that come at you. And but I knew kind of early on, like really early on, probably even before, you know, the split and moving between states. Um, I think I knew that martial arts was probably going to have something to do with that. Um, you know, if you go back you know, early as a kid and, you know, I'm 50, so we just get up, get that out of the way and date myself. Um, but <laughs> and you look back and there's all those standard answers that everybody has and, you know, and undeniably Bruce Lee and, you know, Kung Fu, the TV show, which I watched, but wasn't like super into, but I was, I was thinking about the things that really connected with me as a young child. and. An, an odd uh, answer came up into my head. So in, in 1977, I was a six-year-old standing in line waiting for Star Wars. <laughs> and I, I consider myself lucky enough to be able to see that movie in the theater as a six-year-old. And I think it, it's going to sound super dorky, super geeky, but I, I consider myself lucky to have done that. But I think it had an impact on me. I think something about, and we all know that, you know, even George Lucas says that the Jedi, the whole Jedi thing was it, taken from the martial arts. Yeah. So I think somewhere down deep, that had an effect on me. So even before, you know, I, I moved to New England, I, um, you know, I had asked, I was like, you know, I want to do karate. And I was, I, probably 10, 11, and it was no, 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 no. So it just didn't happen. So it wasn't, it wasn't until, you know, I moved to New England and uh, lived with my mother that um, I was able to start, and that was around 80, 85, 86-ish. 
you know, sort of mid mid teen years there. And I definitely, you know, I I was getting into some fights. Uh, not a lot. I wasn't getting in trouble with the law. I wasn't that kind of a of a kid, but I definitely had a something underneath. You know, a don't know if I was lost. Don't know if I was just angry. Um, but definitely need to. A lot of kids at that age are, even if you know they have, they have a a beautiful home life. Even if both parents are together and they're not moving around, you know, it can still be a rough time for a adolescent early teen. For, for sure, you know now now having you know a child of my own and having you know lots of teens in the dojo, it's, you definitely get to see that firsthand. But you know <laughs> that, that that battle of figuring out who you are or who you want to be. Um, no wonder, no wonder we're upset at that age. <laughs> it's just sure. it's just not easy. So it's not an option. You're figuring stuff out. And at some point, it, it sounds like your mother relents and says yes. She did. And, but if we go back actually a little bit from that, so that would have been probably end of eighth grade or something like that, that I actually ended up starting. But there was kind of a catalyst before that. Hmm. So when I, when I finally moved, um, we ended up moving to um, southeastern Connecticut, uh, right on the border of Rhode Island. And... Um, it was the beginning of seventh grade, and I, uh, I was I, I looked a little different. I had long blonde hair, even as a seventh grader. Um, not a lot of kids had really were rocking the long hair then, um, and I got bullied real bad. Um, one individual in particular, and um, you know the. It's it's funny because you know bullying is not funny, of course. But the, I think about this occasionally. Is that I think about this and I brought this up, and I think it's an important part of my journey. Um, and I wonder if you know, wonder if the bullies ever remember this. And I doubt it. I doubt that these people are sitting here, you know, thirty five years later, thinking about the impact that they had on somebody's life. Um, and what I do find interesting about this is I, I'm a firm believer that there are two kinds of teachers in our life. There are teachers that are going to teach us what to do. And then there are ones that are going to teach us what not to do. And, you know, this individual, you know, taught me how not to be a, 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 a good person, you know, how to, how, how not to treat people. So it was a lesson nonetheless, but it was one of those classic stories where, you know, I didn't want to go to school and I'd fake a upset stomach and, you know, and I, and I got, I got, I got beat pretty good quite a few times, um, you know, throughout seventh grade. So it, that had a major impact on me not feeling safe, not feeling like I could protect myself. Yeah. Um, you know, and who knows where that would have gone to, um, had I had stayed in that state. The that that situation didn't end until I fought back, and there was no karate involved. Even though, in retrospect, I think I threw an axe kick on him. But <laughs> <laughs> that that there, wow! So here's the funny thing: is we were actually axe kicks don't usually come out pre-training, <laughs> right? So what what's interesting about this is that the final kind of episode of this battle with this individual ended up in our um, our gym's locker room, and he jumped me and we ended up on the ground, kind of opposite head to feet thing. And his head was down there. So it was a ground based, early MMA, I guess, ground based axe kick that kind of just hit him across the face and, um, you know, evidently broke his nose. Um, he bled a bit, quite a bit. And, but it was, it was enough of a resistance from me where he never even looked at me again. Mm -hmm. But building up to that every day of school was anxiety and fear and looking around corners and, you know, not wanting to go certain places because I knew that's where he was going to be. So that one day, that one moment of standing up for myself made all the difference in the world. So 
fast forward about a year, my mother finally relents and, you know, says, all right, well, you, you got to figure it out, you know, what, what you're going to do. And, you know, so I had gotten, my best friend and I had gotten this little guest pass, kind of a business card size guest pass for three free classes. So the, the, the dojo was probably about four or five miles from my house. So I could get on my bike and ride to the dojo, but I was too scared to go in because I looked in and it appeared to be mostly all adults, uh, all mostly high ranking people, all beating the heck out of each other. <laughs> so, so I sat there for about a month with my hands cupped around my face, looking in the window, way too scared to go inside. So a couple of times, the, the owner of that school had seen me and came over to the door and then I promptly ran away. Mm. And like I said, that went on for about a month. And then finally, I couldn't run away. They kind of caught me, said, hey, come on in. And I had that guest pass with me. I've been holding on to it for a while. And um, so my best friend and I went in and we took our, uh, took our first classes together. And what, what was your friend doing during this time? Was he also peering in, running away with you? I think, I think to a lesser degree, you okay. know, if we were, if we happened to be out and riding our bikes together, you know, we'd stop and he seemed kind of interested. I don't know if he was as interesting, as interested in it as I was, because I just seem to remember going there a lot. And anytime I was in that area, go around the corner and look in the window, and, you know, even if it was just a casual roll by, yeah. just to look and see what was going on in the dojo. Um, but yeah, I'm not, he, he, he was definitely there with me a bit. Um, what, what I'm most fascinated about, as you're talking about this moment, this moment just before I would imagine you're going to start training and that this changes your life, is this contrast between here's here's this violent situation that's come up that has really taken hold of you, made an impact on you. And I don't get the sense that you were terribly talkative about it with your mother. No, no, not really. My my okay. brother, I have an older brother. My brother, uh, my brother tried to help once with it and ended up um, meeting that same individual on the street and um, gave him a, a, a bit of a, um, a whooping, as you could say. And that only made things worse once I got mm. back to school. Sure. So, so I, I, I pretty much kind of, you know, clammed up about it. And, you're on your own. Yeah. So you're on your own. You recognize somehow, possibly in part because of watching Star Wars, and by the way, everybody who was roughly that age that saw Star Wars in the theater talks about it as a religious experience. So I, I wasn't there, but I get it. Yeah, I get it just from hearing people talk about it. You've got this interesting contrast of this violence around you and you see an option for a solution in martial arts training. That's the connection I'm, I'm hearing. But the way you described your first... Uh, reaction they were beating on each other it's it's this paradox isn't it that here's this violence that teaches you how to avoid violence and it sounds like even at that young age there was something about it that was scary but you recognized the importance i i, I would tend to agree with you about that um and i think you know it, you look in the window of any martial arts school that happens to be sparring right now and i I imagine that new people walking into my dojo look at, you know, when my students are sparring and think, oh my gosh, I, they're, 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 they're beating each other. I mean, I can only imagine that that's the, the impression that they get. Um, but there was something, there was something almost safe about it because you weren't seeing people get hurt. You weren't, you weren't mm -hmm. seeing people in pain, but you were definitely witnessing skill. So it was to me, I, I don't know if I, if I looked in the, those windows and thought of it as, as violence per se, you know what I mean? 
Mm, I, I do. I'm, I'm, and again, as a, as a teenager, who, who really knows what I was looking at, but, you know, looking back retrospectively, um, you know, it just, I mean, let's be honest, first of all, it was just really cool you know, to look in that window and watch these guys do what they were doing with the skill that they had. It was just really cool. Scary, but really cool. Yeah, those aren't mutual exclu- mutually exclusive, are they? No. no. Okay. So he catches you at the door, and you can't run away in time. What does he say? And come on in. Um, introduces himself, brings me in, kind of shows me around the school. Uh, basically, the the opposite of what I had anticipated it to be. Mm-hmm. You know how you know anxiety is going to turn it into something that it's not. Um, you know, so it was. I felt I felt welcome. Uh, I don't know if I felt at home yet, uh, but I definitely, it, it was inviting. Um, and the fact that there weren't a lot of teenagers, or I, I don't even know if there were any children hardly in the dojo at that time, um, and very few teenagers. Um, it, I, I, me and my, my, my friend, we stood out, you know, as you know, kids almost. But, um, it definitely felt felt like, you know, come on in, you know, experience this and, you know, it's not going to hurt you. We're not going to, you know, it was, uh, I think the initial experience is probably the only one that made me actually do that first lesson. Mm. Sounds very welcoming. Yes. Until we get to the first lesson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so we, we get there for the first lesson and. And we're talking, you know, at this point, there it's an adult class. There's green belts, brown belts, black belts. There. No white belts, no kids. So we're the odd ducks. So we go through and we're doing, you know, just regular classes and warm-ups and stretches. And I remember being incredibly inflexible and, you know, thinking, I don't even know if I can do this part, let alone all the rest of that stuff. And um, And then class went through pretty fine nothing stood out until like the last section of class where we sparred on the first day and back then there was no chest guard or headgear or any of that kind of stuff it was hey here are some mitts go fight these guys which of course i found out later these guys are all tournament champions and you know (laughs) best in their division and all that sure kind of thing and you know, so I said, it couldn't be any other way. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they couldn't be. You know, four classes ahead of you and barely know what's going on. No, nope, no. Nope. That that wouldn't make for a good movie. Yeah, absolutely not. So, um, so it was a really rough class, and I, of course, didn't get anything even resembling a hit in on anyone. Um, got hit a lot, and um you know, went through the class and we got done and get outside. And my best friend looks at me and goes, screw this. I'm not coming back. (laughs) And I went back Hmm. and I never, I, I, why? I I don't know. That's such a good question. You start off, you're afraid you get beat up you know, in a, in a similar way to what you were trying to escape, Yeah. you know, certainly with less malintent, but at 14, if I'm doing my math right, yeah. you may not have recognized that. And then you've got the, the social validation from your friend saying, I'm not going to do this. And you return counter to all of that. Yeah. Yeah. God, I wish I knew why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I did, but it's, it's such a good question that I did. We could probably sit here all day talking and I don't know if I could come up with an answer to that one. There, there, we go back to the beginning of our conversation where, um, fate was it, was it, was I supposed to be there? I don't know. Don't know if I believe in that, but it sounds good. <laughs> sure does. It, it's funny. Cause you know, to this day, 35 years later, when I, 
when I run across, occasionally run across that friend, he still looks at me and goes, why did you stay? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Do you have a guess? I, I think that something down deep, and if we go back to the fact that you know, I, I do believe that I was an angry young man that was trying to to deal with all the stuff that had happened to him from, you know, the divorce of my parents and mm -hmm. the, the bullying and, you know, and like my, my brother, I love him to death. He was kind of a jerk back then, as most, I think, older brothers are. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's part of the job description. I think so. Um, but I think I think generally I was just... You know, if we go back a little further, you know, when my parents split, you know, I spent a couple of years with my father and um, and stepmother. And I don't necessarily want this to turn into a counseling session or anything, but, you know, there was there was some abuse there. Yeah. And I think that rooted something in me to where I just, like I said, I think I grew up an angry young man. And I think down deep, either I wanted to never have to experience those things again, or I or wanted to have the skill to, to I don't know, if, I, I think it would be too pure of a comment, you know, and say that I was, you know, just looking to defend myself. And maybe I just wanted to be tough, you know, because mm. as a kid, you don't you don't rationalize this as well. You know, I want to be a just a wholesome person, and I want to, you know, be able to defend myself. I don't think kids think that way. Um, I think we want to think they do, but I think I just I was probably sick and tired of just these moments that mm -hmm. I was that were out of my control. And I think down deep, I felt that martial arts, crop in particular, could give that to me. Um, in in some almost subconscious way, because I don't even know if I rationalize that as a as a teenager. Now, one of the things I'm wondering, you know, we and anybody who's raised children, whether that's through training or biologically, knows that kids learn by testing boundaries. You know, they push, they find where where the lines are, and what you're describing to me sounds like a childhood that didn't have the same type of boundaries and structure that one might expect in a child's upbringing. You brought up Star Wars. I'm going to guess that at some point prior to 85, you saw Empire. Yes. And the impact on a young boy craving structure of the training for Luke with Yoda. I mean, that's, you, you can, you can take Luke Yoda and you can throw it into Daniel Miyagi or any number of other paradigms, you know, any other exa examples of the paradigm of student and teacher. Absolutely. And so I'm wondering if you saw, okay, there's something that I, that I want on some level, boom, anybody who trained at a karate school, any martial arts school in the eighties. It was all structure. That's all it was. It was structure and getting beat on. Yeah. And so it sounds like you step in and bam, there's what you were looking for. There's what was missing. What were those boundaries? And and you might be right. And I mean, it's there's no reason why that shouldn't be correct. Uh, I don't think, and I, I think, I think it's subconscious. Hmm. Uh, I definitely don't think that I was you know, intelligent enough or self-aware enough at that time to be able to say, you know, I'm lacking something here. Uh, let's go fill this gap. But, you know, our, 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 our brains have a way of doing that for us sometimes. So I uh, think you might be right. Hmm. So you get there and you go back for class two and you're still going strong now. And you can't separate martial arts from, from who you are. It's coded into your DNA at this point. 
what does the path between those two points look like? An, a, an interesting one. <laughs> okay. So I, what I, you know, what I had happened into was a school who, um, especially back in the 80s, did a lot of open tournaments. It was mm -hmm. um, a lot of competition. And I, I didn't, I just thought it was part of it. You know, roughly around that time, Karate Kid came out, and of course, centered around a tournament. Um, so, you know, tournaments were, were a big, big thing then. And I got to be honest when I say that I didn't absolutely love them, nor was I particularly good at them. Um, there was just, it was just something about it that just didn't click. And I did quite a few years of them. And again, and I'm, I'm you know, not still not an adult at this point. You know, I'm 15, 16, 17. Um, and just really not, it wasn't my thing, for sure. Uh, as far as like the school owner and the people that, uh, you know, that were in there, there were a lot of really good, you know, tournament competitors. Um, I mean, world class. And it just, it didn't really click with me. Training did. And every aspect of training, Kobodo, Karate, you know, and, and, and sparring, all, it all loved it all. But just the whole competing thing and the whole, um, I don't want to use the word showing off, but it was, I don't know if I just didn't like the attention or didn't like the, the, the eyes on me or whatever it was. Um, it just wasn't my thing. Mm. So. And it's okay. Yeah. So one, probably one of the most important days, in, as far as I'm concerned in my development as a martial artist, uh, I'll never forget it. It was, it was a class. It was a rather large class. I think it was a, a green belt at the time. So I was like three rows back in class, just stretching. And there's a row of black belts in, you know, in the front. There's a row of brown belts in front of me. I, I'm no one. I'm just another student in the crowd. And we're stretching out, and the door to the training room opens, and somebody tells the owner of the school, the head instructor, that he's got a phone call. So he stands up, looks past two rows, and says, Hey, Dave. Take over class. Now I had to be like 16 or 17 years old at the time, maybe 17. And the first thing I do is have a heart attack followed by an aneurysm. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why me? I'm three rows back. Like there's a lot of people that can take this class over. Why are you even looking at me? And again, I, nothing about me stood out. I wasn't, like I guess I certainly wasn't tournament champion. So I get up front and everybody's in kind of a straddle split position and we're all touching our left leg. And my big contribution to class was switch, <laughs> go, to the, go to the other side. And I basically led them through stretching and then started to get into, you know, maybe the, the, the bulk of class a little bit when the instructor came back in, took over. And I jumped back in. But that moment stands out as my first teaching experience. And looking back at it now, it really was the epicenter of what would guide and drive me pushing forward. Because now, you know, at my age, looking back at that, even though early on in my training, it felt like being in karate and, and, and doing all that was, was where I was supposed to be. But now I realize that standing in front of a student, a group of students and teaching them and making a difference, that's really where I was supposed to be. Hmm. And to me, so it sounds like yeah. post aneurysm, it, it yeah. got a little better. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> You know, so, so after that happened, um, you know, some time goes by and 
you know, in that dojo, as happens in most dojos, there's there's a mass exodus. The senior student goes off, opens his own school. You know, a bunch of students follow, and you're left in this school with, you know, none of the senior, you know, black belts or teaching staff. And so then I was um, I was offered a position as kind of an assistant teacher. This is as a green belt, um, and I jumped at it. I I think I jumped at it almost without thinking. And came down, you know, after school, rode my bike down there once I could drive, you know, I drove my car there. And, you know, it wasn't paid at the time. It was just a volunteer kind of a leadership team basis thing. And I'd go and I'd teach. And then I started teaching a lot. And eventually got to the point where, you know, I was teaching the bulk of the classes and then was taken on as a, as an employee as as staff member and and then did that with that you know at that dojo for for a long time um and really really found like i hate to say it again but where i belonged um it's almost like i found me like i am i think i as a human in general, I think I am most comfortable standing on my dojo floor teaching. Mm. You know, and so so I did that happily for for quite a few years. And so around 1993, I'm engaged now to my now wife. And, you know, we're planning on having a family in and I understand that it's it's difficult. You know, for for dojos to support multiple people unless they're really large, and so I ended up um, leaving that position and going off and getting a job with health insurance and and all that kind of stuff. And I'd go back to the dojo, and I, I was still training on my own, but I'd go back to the dojo and teach every now and then. And um, so around ninety, this is this is ninety three. I got married. So ninety four, uh, in a weird. You know, let me back up a minute. I was miserable in my other job. <laughs> <laughs> I make, and I, I'm more than honest about this, I make a terrible employee. I'm horrible. Um, especially when you get to the point where you're comfortable enough where you start thinking, well, well, can't we do it this way? And I think we can adjust it. And it's, it's almost like the the martial arts strategist in me mm. is always trying to find out, find a better system. And so I make a terrible employee and I hated it as miserable. Um, and my wife knew I was miserable and we had, a, uh, she was pregnant at the time. So, uh, a bad turn of things, her grandmother passes away, mm. um, lived a long, healthy life. Um, but she left us some money. And when I say some money, it was like $3,000. So not a inheritance, but a little bit of money. And at the time, we were dead broke. I mean, you know, having to meet the electric company guy at the meter so he wouldn't shut the electricity off kind of broke. And um, so we get this money, and we're just trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. We're going to pay this bill. We're going to pay that bill. And my wife makes a comment that is legend at this point. And she says, why don't we open a dojo? And I laughed. Did she train? No. Mm. And so I laughed and I looked at her and she wasn't laughing. Like she was serious about it. And so that was this seed that got planted in my head. Like, wait, is this something that I can actually do? It almost didn't dawn on me at the time. And I knew I was miserable. And I needed to get on to something else. And that seed planted uh, the, the tree that grew from that, from that one comment from my wife. Um, that became just a drive that hasn't stopped. And that's 25 years ago. Mm. Um, and Did that, you ever ask her why that was her idea, her recommendation for that money? No, I never asked her that in that way. Because it it sounds, I mean, if, if I think about 
the situation that, that you were in, and it's one that I've been in multiple times, kind of living hand to mouth, not having a, a financial cushion, that $3,000 probably could have been game changing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And obviously she knew you were passionate about karate. But there's there's something there. And that I think that that's what's really striking me is whether it was, you know, sixth sense faith in in you that this was a good financial move. And anybody listening to this who's open to school knows that it is rarely a good financial move to open a martial arts school. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But there there's something there. There's something really powerful that probably speaks more to your relationship with her than anything else and it, it blows me away and I'm, I'm i think it's awesome you know i'm looking looking back 25 years you know she has definitely been the my you know the best advocate for you know what i can and can't do and mm -hmm. um the, i mean i think the the ultimate in support because i have done some crazy things throughout the years and I wake up one morning and say honey i want to be a beekeeper and she goes okay <laughs> You know, at the age of 41, I walked up to her and I said, uh, honey, I, I, I think I want to become a volunteer firefighter. And she says, okay. <laughs> so she she's always there to support. Always. Always. Okay. And so she says that. She says, you should open a dojo. And what's next? What happens? So... As, like as far as the timeline goes, I don't even remember that. I mean, that was that was right around '94. Um, so I started looking, just driving around. Uh, I knew I didn't want to, you know, open a school in or around, you know, where my my previous teacher school was. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to go off and do my own thing. So I just drove around. I didn't want to move too far from home. You know, where we had lived at the time, which was in, you know, uh, Southern Rhode Island. And um, so I found this, you know, as, as most, I think, early dojo owners go for is, uh, you know, what, like, what do they say in real estate? Location, location, location. Mm -hmm. Most martial arts schools go price, price, price. <laughs> <laughs> so I found this just off the beaten path little teeny space that was i don't even know if it was 400 square feet it was little and it was in a town you know probably 15 20 minutes from where we lived but the whole town has got 8000 people in it hmm. the 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 adjoining town which is you know they, they kind of act as one has another 8000 so there's only 16000 people in this entire kind of region and you know so i was talking to people and then you know talked to my previous instructor and you know what i got from everyone almost across the board was a dojo will never survive there um you're making a mistake think about your family you have a baby on the way um you know how could you do this you have a, a steady job so all these, it was, with an exception of my wife, every other person around us was telling us not to do it. So I had to do it. Mm. <laughs> there, was, there was no option. I don't know if that's just my oppositional defiance <laughs> or, um, or if that's, again, that, that drive in a direction that I, I needed, I needed to, to, to fulfill. So ended up negotiating a little bit with this, uh, with the guy that owned the building. And it was a February 1st of 1995, uh, was my very first class in my dojo. Wow. And it was funny uh, we reminisce about it all the time as this tiny little space, we were having carpet put down cause it was concrete and, you know, certainly couldn't afford a wood floor or anything. So just putting down some carpet and we stood in the hallway waiting for the carpet guys to finish so we could start class. Um, 
and and it was a great class. In fact, I, I mean, I, to this day, I still have three of those students with me. Hmm. Um, Any aneurysms? No heart no, attacks. No, no aneurysms. Or, well, I mean, many along the way. That's for sure. <laughs> many along the way. Uh, I think we can all agree that 2020 was one gigantic aneurysm, but <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, that was um, that was 26 years ago. Hmm. And you still have three of those students. Yeah. If I were to ask them, if I was to sit down with the three of them and say, "Why?" What would they say? Oh, now I got to put words in other people's mouths. That's a really, really good question. Well, clearly you've done something right. You've presented information or, or presented an environment to them that spoke to them that they value. I, I would. Twenty six years is a long time. It is, and and I would hope that's what they would say. Um, my my senior student, um, you know, has has you know my senior student that's still in my dojo. Um, I do have an, one of the other individuals that are still with me. He has his own dojo in Houston. Um, but uh, you know, I I think she would have said the one that is you know with me in in my dojo here. She. <sighs> She, she often talks about how training, and these are her words, that training in the dojo saved her life. Mm. Whether it was the state of mind that she was in at the time. Um, she also jokes that, you know, it was, you know, it was some sort of like, you know, $69 special with a free uniform. And she decided either that or Weight Watchers and the free uniform hooked her. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, the, the, the funny little anecdote that, that she talks about. But she has told me, you know, that the, the dojo has saved her life. And probably similar to me is, I don't know if she could separate, you know, who she is from her karate anymore. Hmm. So it, you're right. At some point, I think an impact was made. Um, you know, and early on, God knows I made, I made some serious mistakes and, you know, wasn't necessarily the best sensei that I could have been. And Can you share one of them? We, we don't, we don't get those stories very often. And because I'm, I'm always aware that we have people listening at very different parts of their journey. We have people who are contemplating opening a school right now and they're terrified <laughs> because they don't want to make mistakes because their instructor has never made a mistake in front of them, or at least that they're aware of. <laughs> and anybody who has opened a school knows that opening the school, usually the t something about when, where, how, why, one of those four, at least one of them was a mistake. Yeah. Uh, in, in my case, when I opened my school, I think at least two of them of the four was a mistake, but share, share a mistake that some of those listeners might, listen to and say okay if he can recover from that i uh, if if i had to put like the number one thing that i think was the number one mistake it was me it was who i was at the time how i saw myself how i saw my students how i you know and i'll be honest how i treated people um as a 25 year old owning a dojo. Um, because, I mean, the, ex the, the examples I had had at the time were not necessarily good ones. Um, you know, it was the, you know, the holier than thou, you know, when I came up, the holier than thou sensei and, you know, the brutality of that martial arts was in the 80s. Um, the if you're not tough enough you'll never make it in this dojo mm -hmm. and you know very cobra kai of you oh so much so much <laughs> and and i without a doubt i i those early years you know i'm sure i guarantee that a, a bunch of students that didn't stay and train was probably because of of me so i think the advice looking back 
is number one, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, we're, we're here to provide a service and it's a service that matters and don't let anybody ever tell you any different because I've had some people, you know, that are not martial artists say, well, what's the big deal? You're just teaching karate. And those of us that are in the martial arts and have helped people and made a difference in people's lives and had an impact, we understand how much more important this is than just teaching karate. Um, so, you know, don't let people, don't let anybody make you believe that. But there's no need for an instructor to, to take themselves so seriously, to, you know, put themselves on a pedestal, to, to, to treat people in a way that, you know, would make them want to leave your school. Um, and I don't think I did anything maliciously. It was just the way I went about things, the, the methods that I used to try to accomplish uh, what I was trying to accomplish. And many, much of that may have been just inexperience. As, as a teacher, I mean, I don't have any formal teaching experience or education. Um, but I think it was just mistakes that probably had to be made along the way for me. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I, am. I don't know how many instructors would actually admit this, but I was probably responsible, as I'm sure many people are when they start off. I was probably responsible with giving people a bad experience uh, when it came to the martial arts early on. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm an incredibly introspective person, so I'm constantly now, um, and I think I have always been, uh, looking at what I say and metering what I say and trying to find different, better ways to do what it is that I do. And I think that all those experiences of, um, of, of maybe damaging a student's potential growth made an impact uh, hmm. on me. And, you know, I, I, one of the, the missions, I guess, that, that I've been on is just to, to improve as a teacher, to improve as a, as a man, as a person, um, to continually get better at what I do, um, while being, you know, a good person at the same time. Um, my my senior students that I mentioned before, they refer to me nowadays as the kinder and gentler sensei, which which speaks to kind of how I was in my twenties. Yeah. How did that feel the first time you heard them say that? It's was funny it relief because, or was it? Yeah, I, I, I think they said it almost like to the other students, you don't know what we went through to get here. Hmm. You know, because, you know, if you look at the, the, the black belts that I raise now, you know, I'm a better teacher, I, I believe. Um, and I have way better methods, I believe, than I used to have. So I can get, I can, I can make you know, changes. I can, get the results that I want out of my students um, with better methods. So I think at those guys is having lived through the quote difficult years. Um, I think they look back at it with, with nostalgia, honestly. Um, but I think they, they also chuckle at, you know, the, I think they understand and they know that I've gotten better at things and my ability to to convey this information, it, not just by you know, you know, yelling and being like you said, very Cobra Kai of me. Um, I, I I think I think they look at it, um, you know, really in a positive way. I don't think it was said as a negative way, um, and I think nowadays they truly understand why it was necessary uh, to to change. Um, it it sounds like there's some sensitivity in knowing that 
maybe your methods back then weren't ideal. Have you, and you even brought, brought this up as a, uh, not turning it into a therapy as, episode, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I think it's important for others to, to hear the answer to this question. Have you forgiven yourself for that? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and the reason I think I'm capable or was capable of doing that is not one of those students that I've had, you know, hundreds or thousands of students that I've had in 26 years have ever come back to me and ne- ever had anything negative to say. I've seen so many of them. And what I get from them is, you know, I missed my, I missed my training. I wish I hadn't stopped. Um, I have such great memories of that time, you know, and then they reminisce about, you know, do you remember our time in the old dojo? And it's everything I've gotten back over the years has been so positive. You know, if, if I ended up just, I, I know that I needed to grow, but I wonder if I was harder on myself than they would have been. Probably. We usually are. Yeah. So, you know, to, to answer your question, I, I definitely feel that I have um, forgiven myself for that because of what it is that I feel that I, I, I do now. The, the, the service that I provide, um, not as a dojo owner, but as a sensei, uh, to me, those are two completely separate things. Um, you know, and, and again, the feedback and the, the, the progress that I watch in my students and the growth and, you know, and I think I've forgiven myself and I think I have in some way redeemed those mistakes, which, you know, if I knew they were, if I knew I was going to make them, I wouldn't have made them. But, you know, we don't have a time machine to go back. We can only do better for the future. Right. Mm. Let's talk about the future. Mm. Doesn't sound like you're going to stop training. Doesn't sound like you're going to stop teaching. Doesn't sound like anything that, that you've said suggests that you're your comment that you can't separate martial arts from you, you know, the thing we talked about at the top is untrue. It, it, is, it is you. It is hard-coded. It is wired in a way that people listening right now are nodding along to. They get it. So how does that show up when we look 5, 10, 20, however many years down the road you want to go? Hmm. So... You know, thinking about that 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 idea of of looking into the future, um, I have to kind of look at people that have made impacts in my life, and you know that are my seniors, not just necessarily in rank, but in in age and experience, and 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 look to their examples. Um, you know, I, I want to name a couple people, and one of the 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 big things that changed in my life, you know, during the course of, you know, all those years of training, and you know, I was introduced to um, Sensei Doug Perry, who is probably the most influential martial artist in my life, uh, without a doubt, you know, and to see the 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 impact that he has made. He just celebrated his eighty fourth birthday. Um, he. To, to see the reach that he has as far as influence. And when I say influence, I don't mean to, to change people, but to help people. And, you know, the, the knowledge that he has and the abilities that he has, um, you know, it's something that I continue to chase after. And, um, you know, and I love that journey. I just love that battle. And there are many along the way, but he, he definitely stands out. Um, but also there's another individual that really is a, is a major kind of influence in my life is Kiyoshi Pat Haley out of California. And he has a saying that he refers to as QTR, which is quality time remaining and looking at your life. Uh, he uses an example. If you take out a tape measure 
and you put your finger at, you know, I'm not sure what the, the average lifespan of a human is right now at 80, you know, 80, 80 years old. Yeah. And you put your other finger where your age is. And you look at what you have between those two. And what are you going to do with it? And that's, that's the quality time remaining thing is, you know, what are we going to do with that? And for me, you know, there's, there's a few things that, that, that I feel a drive towards. One is of course my dojo and my students, um, and a, a continued, uh, drive motivation to reach as many people as humanly possible to help as many people through i mean if you look back at our at my story so far today you know there's been things that i've had to overcome and i think that you know karate in particular has been the thing that has gotten me through all of that and knowing that and knowing that there are people out there everybody is battling with something um you know whether it's anxiety or depression or you know, abuse or something that I, f I thoroughly believe that karate and not just karate, but martial arts in general, because to me, it doesn't matter. You know, we're all, we're all heading in the same direction. Um, I believe it can help. And I believe that, you know, I believe that if, uh, if everyone in the world did martial arts, the world would be a vastly different place. So my goal is really to reach as many as possible. And I don't want that to sound like, you know, I have this great power to go out and help. I think all martial artists have this power to go out and help. Um, I think it's, it's part of what we do as martial artists, which is to pass down what it is that was gifted to us. Yeah, we worked for it, but it was, it's a gift. And I think that looking at what quality time, hopefully that I have remaining, you know, to 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 help as many people as I can, to touch as many people as I can in the way that martial arts had touched me, um, you know, and hopefully give them give them something, just a piece even of what was given to me through this thing that we all love. Hmm. Well said. If people want to get a hold of you, how would they do that? So probably the best way would be through Facebook, David Aaron's um on on Facebook. Uh my my website is my dojo website. It is East Coast Karate dot net. Um, but there are email links and stuff uh on there as well. Uh my email address is sensei at eastcoastkarate.net um, but facebook is probably the the best okay. way to get a hold of me cool. yeah we'll we'll link all that stuff in the show notes okay. all right you went deep today thank you for for that opportunity to to have this kind of a conversation one of the things i love about the show is that you know depending on where i'm at and where the guest is at just on those particular days we have a certain kind of conversation. You and I could talk in an hour or tomorrow or next year and have a wholly different conversation. Yeah, I was, uh, I was curious, you know, where the conversation was going to go and yeah. you, you just never know. You don't. And that's, that, to me, that's the fun. That's why after 600 and something episodes, six years plus, that's why it, it's still so engaging for me. And, and, and I, I do want to say congratulations on them. That's, a, that's an achievement and an Thank accomplishment you. and... You know, you guys are doing really, really good work out there. Um, and I, I, I just hope more and more people get get turned on to it. Because I think the one thing that I like the most about it is, you know, you grow up in a dojo. You guys have talked about this in episodes before where, you know, I grew up in a karate dojo. So karate is the best thing in the world or grew up in a taekwondo dojo. So that's the best thing in the world. And, you know, you sit and you just listen to a few dozen episodes and you realize, we're all the same. It it doesn't matter what patches on our uniform or, you know, what sign is above the door. Um, and, and, and having these conversations really quantifies that as, um, you know, we're, we're all, we're all brothers and sisters in this. Like I said, at the top, 
quotable, powerful, a great story. Thank you, Kyoshi. Appreciate you coming on the show. Had a great time. Yeah, let's, let's talk again soon. I really do have the best job in the world, you guys. I can't say that enough. Now, those of you listening, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Go check out all the stuff related to this episode. Go look at the photos. Go look at the links. Connect with the guests. Let them know you listened to the show. Let them know that you enjoyed their episode, that you got something from it. I hear from guests periodically that some of you will write to them and tell them about how the story they shared or the vulnerable moment that they contributed really meant a lot to you. And so when you do that, it helps them feel better about their appearance and makes them more likely to recommend other people to the show. It all contributes. So please be part of it. I appreciate that effort. And if you want to go even further and support what we do, well, you've got choices. Leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or don't forget the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And remember, we've got this incredible strength and conditioning program. It doesn't require any equipment. It's built just for martial artists, and it's not going to slow you down and uses the latest science. And you know what? I made it myself. You know I'm a thoughtful person. You know I research way too much. So go check that out at whistlekickprograms.com. If you have guest suggestions or other feedback, let us know. Best way to do so is to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick, and that takes us to the end. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Whistlekick.